In December last year, I found myself standing in the bookshop in Durham Cathedral, scanning the shelves for something on the Psalms, and I saw a book by Tom Wright jumping out at me. The title wasn't particularly sexy or out there. It just stated its intended purpose of finding God in the Psalms. But the subtitle resonated with me far more deeply. Just three simple words, sing, pray, live. Their interconnectivity drew me immediately. In community, we have talked from the early days about the sense of being in exile, being in a state of not belonging, standing awkwardly like a school child on their first day at school with a too big blazer and school bag, teetering on the brink of a noisy schoolyard full of wheeling kids, at once leaning into and cowering from an unfamiliar call into the wild. Inhabiting this space takes courage, a step away from protected patterns and comfortable surroundings an acknowledgement of the need to wander and somehow lean in and trust the journey, even when desolation and hopelessness kick in. And wow, did God's people feel that sense of desolation and hopelessness during the time of the exile in Babylon, when paradoxically the people, found, the people who found it unthinkable to sing the Lord's song in a strange land, may well have discovered that it was only through actually singing psalms and creating new ones that they could keep hold of sanity and hope. Tom Wright suggests that scripture is, at its heart, the great story that we sing in order not just to learn it with our heads, but to become part of it through and through the story that in turn becomes part of us. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul uses the Greek word poiema in the sense of works of art to refer to the early followers of Christ. And poiema is the root word of the English words poem and poetry. So the inference is that we are to ultimately become walking poems or songs through Christ Jesus, whose hearts have been changed through living in God's story, and not least the story of exile. For we are God's poema, or works of art. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Wright suggests that God gives us these poems, the Psalms, as a gift in order that through our praying and singing of them, he may give us as a gift to his world. We are called to be living, breathing, praying, singing poems. How cool is that? The psalmists were totally bereft at the loss of the temple. And yet it was the poets and the prophets among them who refused to believe that God had abandoned them or that their purpose as a chosen people had been lost. When it seemed as though that might have happened, the psalmists looked back at God's mighty deeds of old in order to claim them as the pattern for the future. Psalm 77 illustrates this well. I cry out to God, yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? But then, I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. When the Red Sea saw you, O oh God, its waters looked and trembled. 
The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea. Your pathway through the mighty waters. A pathway that no one knew was there. You led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. It was the role of the poets and the musicians to link the present to the past and to say, remember, and blessed be God, even when the tide was running strongly in the wrong direction. And even if it made them come across as well, you know, a bit weird. Jacob Nordby reflects on this idea in the opening of his thought-provoking book, Blessed Be the Weird, which begins with Beatitudes for the Weird. Blessed are the weird people. Poets, misfits, writers, mystics, heretics, painters and troubadours. For they teach us to see the world through different eyes. And for these early exiles, it was so important to somehow stand firm in the present in order to find hope for the future, as well as to believe that Yahweh would return in all his glory at some point, despite some incredibly depressing political realities in the interim and a sense of ongoing grief and loss. In Northumbria community, we have often discovered that scripture has given language to something that we have been experiencing on our journey. And there is a sense in which the authentic range of emotions that are expressed in the Psalms helps us to stand within the paradox of intense joy and pain that transcends time. Learning to sing in such circumstances, it seems to me, is all about unlocking the creativity that God has given to each one of us so that we might find expression for the whole range of human emotions that we are experiencing as we journey alone together as Northumbria community. Learning to sing involves leaning in and noticing where God is at work in us. And sometimes it's about words or melodies, pictures or visions. And sometimes it's about ways of moving our bodies or creating things through our hands. And sometimes God uses a different way to put a song on our hearts. Last summer, I walked St Cuthbert's Way. It was a five day pilgrimage from Melrose to the holy island of Lindisfarne. It was something that I'd wanted to do for, for quite some time. So blocking out a week in my calendar for that purpose brought me a step closer to being obedient to God in that prompting. However, little did I expect that the timing would fall in the middle of one of the most severe heat waves that the UK had ever experienced. Such was my determination to complete the pilgrimage. I decided to develop a daily routine that meant I would start each day at 5.30 a.m. so I could finish ahead of midday and avoid the hottest part of the day. All went well for the first couple of days and I was blessed by walking with one particular friend who was an experienced long distance walker and who could offer advice about ways to pace myself and the best regime for taking on water and other practical means of surviving the heat. So on day three, I was feeling quite confident, even though it was also my first ever day of solo long distance walking. I awoke to an incredibly thick layer of early morning mist. I asked Dave, who was acting as my support driver, to linger in the bottom of the valley ahead of the stiff hill climb, just in case I needed to turn back. I was still on the Scottish side of the walk, starting in a place called Moor Battle. And as I ascended the first slope, I felt reasonably confident that the path would be well marked. However, it soon became apparent as I walked upwards, that I could only see a few feet ahead of me. 
and on top of that, the early morning mist was actually pretty cold and my clothing was getting very soggy. I found myself starting to create a few strategies in my head. Hmm, if I keep walking and can't actually see where the track is going, I'll need to turn back. Hmm, and if I find my summer layers are still not adequate to keep my body heat up, I'm going to have to retrace my steps. As I went further upwards, the mist quickly surrounded me and visibility became really low. Oddly, I found myself laughing out loud and having a bit of a dialogue with God. It went along the lines of this. I'm sure I've read in the guidebook that today's the highest part of the walk and apparently the views are meant to be stunning. It would be, have been nice to have actually seen them, God. I found myself checking in with myself and realising that I wasn't feeling quite as fearful as I thought I might have done. And then I heard a voice, God's voice, I assumed. This is what he said. I'll show you what you need to see. And as I looked up, I could see one of the Cuthbert Way markers emerging above me, lit up by a ray of sunshine behind it, illuminating its outline in the mist. So I texted Dave and said, I think I'm going to be okay. And then I splodged upwards on the slippery track towards the marker. The path started to become more visible as I approached it. And I could detect it bending over a ridge through some thinner clouds. I remembered my water regime and paused for a few moments to swig my water bottle, preparing myself for, well, I wasn't quite sure what. As I reached the top of the hill, I felt my body contract as I instinctively took sharp intake of breath in, because suddenly I'd broken through the cloud to emerge into what I realised was the edge of a long ridge that stretched as far as my eye could see in both directions. And what I saw resembled a seascape, billowing white cloud waves flowing across the landscape with sheep huddled on various scattered islands within it truly mystical. An unexpected heart song in an unfamiliar landscape. A gift. So I spent many minutes pausing in wonder and several more strolling along the ridge, marvelling at what God had clearly wanted to show me. There was no outward expression needed. I simply needed to inhabit the space that the Creator God had helped me find within myself and look upon its expression with wonder. And so, as we step into this Good Friday space, we return to the terrible moment of Christ's death, and we find him quoting from Psalm 22 verse 1, digging into a song with which he was already familiar, and which was helping him to find language for the pain of these final moments. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if we read further on in the psalm, we'll find other references that tie in with Jesus's final moments. It's a song already written in language that continues to resonate and speak and give voice. May you too find a means to sing, pray and live in and through this Easter season. Psalm 22, for the director of music, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. 
All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let him rescue him. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfil my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it. He has done it.